Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Greetings. Welcome to the show today. Before we begin today, I'd like to give you an update regarding the show. A couple of weeks ago, we aired a special episode where I interviewed a very dear friend and mentor of mine, uh, Bennett Ash. And one of the things we talked about was the difference that it makes having a life that is built on and rooted in the foundation of Christ Jesus. It's interesting, not long after that, we received uh, an encouraging email from a gentleman named Thomas expressing his thanks for her testimony of what a difference it means to be rooted in biblical principles and in a relational experience of God. And he said, you know, I caught this broadcast while flipping through stations on my radio. He says, so in some manner, I took it as a message of encouragement from God to me during a tough time in my life right now. You know, we're very glad to hear that the Lahem Panim broadcast is reaching people who need that hope and encouragement. And there are many ways to listen to the broadcast via our website at lahempanim.org, as well as on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Um, And now we're also excited to announce that we are available to listen to via podcast. And so you can subscribe to us through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast provider. We want to invite you to do that. But thank you so much for listening. And please keep the feedback coming. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at lahempanim at gmail.com. You know, this past Christmas season, I got to travel with my family to Mississippi for my sister Lauren's wedding, and so we found ourselves in a number of airports, and I don't know, airports are not my favorite place to be. Um, I've been in quite a number of them in and throughout my lifetime, but uh, they're very stressful places, um, especially if you're traveling with kids. And if you're ever in an airport, as someone once pointed out, one interesting thing to note is the difference between passengers who hold confirmed tickets and those who are on standby. Um, Because the ones who have confirmed tickets, I mean, they're relaxed. They read newspapers, they chat with their friends, they even sleep. But the ones who are on standby, what are they doing? Well, they're hanging around the ticket counter, they're pacing and pacing. And the difference really is the confidence factor. And I think in our own Christian lives, you know, if you knew that in 15 minutes you would have to stand in judgment before a holy God, and learn your eternal destiny, what would your reaction be? <laughs> would you pace? Um, would you say to yourself, you know, I don't know what, what, what God's going to say. Is it going to be welcome home, child? Or is it going to be depart from me? I never knew you. That's a question every one of us must ask at some point in our lives. Yet if we have placed our faith in Christ and we've chosen to follow him, we can and we ought to have assurance that we are indeed saved. And that's what our passage today is all about. In 1 John 4.17, John circles back to this amazing theme of confidence. He says in verse 17, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Now, this word confidence, it shows up a number of places in John's epistle. In 1 John 2, 28, he says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. And then in chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And then in chapter 5, verse 14, he says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we see that this theme of confidence is an important theme in 1 John, and one that John emphasizes very strongly as we draw nearer to the close of his epistle. John wants his readers to be abiding in Christ, to have that relationship authenticated by having demonstrated in themselves the fruit of a transformed life, a love that is complete, and lastly, to have a life that is marked not by fear, but by confidence, and particularly a confidence for the day of judgment. Now, if you were to Google image search judgment day right now, and I did this just recently, 
you'd find that most of the pictures you would be greeted by are not biblical pictures. Instead um, of pictures of Jesus, you're greeted by photos of Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator looking back at you. Now, as cool as he may have looked in that movie, and as much as I've been told I look like him, and okay, that's not true, uh, we're, talking, we're talking about a very different kind of judgment day. The day of judgment is that time when all people will appear before Christ and be held accountable for their actions. But for Christians, with God living in us through Christ, we don't have any reason to fear this day of judgment because we have been saved from punishment. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so this means that instead we can look forward to the day of judgment because it will mean the end of sin and the beginning of a face-to-face relationship with Jesus Christ. We can have assurance during and leading up to that day, an assurance that produces a confidence, a boldness in how we live, in how we pray, in how we witness. Now, how do we get that assurance and confidence? Well, he says in verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. So we see that we're to have a love that is complete. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a love that is complete? Well, he says, this is how love is made complete among us so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, that's a stunning and powerful statement, and I think what it's pointing us to is the marvelous reality that the true believer is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Romans 3, 21 to 22 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, John is clearly talking about more than our being covered by the righteousness of Christ here in this passage, which is something we call imputed righteousness, where God sees us through the blood of Jesus. Now, as important as that doctrine is, John is careful to communicate that Christ's imputed righteousness must also become his imparted righteousness. He imparts his righteousness to us to where we can be made righteous as God himself is righteous. A strong statement? Yes. But one that is in perfect accord with what God has always said was both possible and necessary. 1 Peter 1, 14-16 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, with our being clothed with the righteousness of Christ, as we experience his love for us and reflect that love back on him, our former fear is replaced with confidence. John writes in verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. He says, The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, I want to point out that what we're talking about here is more than just a feeling of fear or anxiety, which I think we all struggle with from time to time. What we're talking about here is a significant doubt in our salvation. It's interesting to note that before John Wesley's famous Aldersgate experience, where he received assurance of his salvation— Dwight L. Moody writes how, after John Wesley had been preaching for some time, someone said to him, Are you sure, Mr. Wesley, of your salvation? Well, he answered, Jesus Christ died for the whole world. And the person said, Yes, we all believe that. But are you sure that you are saved? And Wesley replied that he was sure that provision had been made for his salvation. No, 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 no. 
But are you sure, Wesley, that you are saved? And it went like an arrow to Wesley's heart, and he had no rest and no power until that question was settled. And we're thankful that it was. What the Apostle John is teaching us is that fear is banished by the confidence that comes to us in and through the love of Christ. And Scripture teaches us that we don't love God and come to Him in love and at the same time hide from Him in terror. We don't have to fear the future judgment and torment and the punishment that goes with that because our sins have been forgiven through faith in Christ. And we've been redeemed and are being perfected in love. That is what it means to live by faith. And that faith is rooted ultimately in the love of God. As verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. And if we ever are afraid of the future, afraid of eternity, afraid of God's judgment, we can remind ourselves of God's love. We know that he loves us perfectly. Romans 8 38-39 38 through 39 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we can resolve our fears, first by focusing on his immeasurable love for us, and then by allowing him to love others through us. In doing so, his love will quiet our fears and give us confidence. Now, if we have that confidence in his love for us and our belonging to him, that love will move us to love those around us. And that love is one of the clearest evidences of the fact that we truly belong to Jesus. John writes in verses 20 to 21, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And so I want to encourage you today to ask God to create that kind of love in you in a deeper way. With that love will come righteousness. And with that righteousness will come the assurance that you both belong to him and that you will share in his kingdom. And there will be that confidence, that boldness that will allow God to use you in a powerful way in your family, in your church, and in your community. Ask him for that today. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God. Thank you.